So I kept saying that there was going to be time for comments, discussion and questions. And I'm so pleased that everyone was listening in terms of, of the speakers uh, sticking to time. And despite our little technological glitches, we now actually have time for comments, questions and discussion. So I'm going to ask you to be ready uh, to provide those. Because we have multiple sites and different uh, technology platforms, I'm going to moderate uh, uh, these questions. I think I, I would say uh, that there's been a theme that's come through from each of the case studies in each of the countries of, of quite remarkable achievements and successes that, that uh, before the partnership started seven years ago, you know, sort of like <coughs> ideas, re remote possibilities, maybe dreams, but now are actually happening. And so I think we can see that there have been really quite uh, uh, wonderful successes with, with in, in each of these countries and that uh, much of this success is a result of the collaboration, the working together across the national borders and boundaries. The way that I'm going to set up the, the comments and discussion is to go around site by site and, and give you the opportunity to speak or if, you've, if you're uh, joining us uh, and been participating by webcast, uh, then to send your, your question or your comment in and then it will be uh, uh, Kim Larkin is monitoring uh, your, your contribution so we'll be able to hear uh, from those who are participating by webcast. I, I think we'll start, uh, actually we can see uh, Gwen on the screen at the moment still. So maybe we'll start with, with the sites that are, are joining us by video connection. So we see um, uh, we see Iqaluit there, or is it say via Ottawa or something? But anyway, it's it's uh, Iqaluit. Uh, and also um, we have Little Current and we have Moose Factory. So if you have a question or comment uh, from uh, one of those three sites, uh, please would you uh, go off mute and, and uh, give us your comment now, please. Or not. I can tell you this is how it usually works. <laughs> I might now uh, sort of uh, give you some forward notice so you can be ready to go off mute and to make a comment or question. Uh, let's go to those who are uh, participating uh, by WebEx, that is uh, through your computer and, and uh, the web-based <coughs> connection. This is an opportunity to go off mute and to, to speak up and make a comment or ask a question. Uh, Roger Strasser, uh, it's Sweden here. Yes, go ahead. That's Nicholas speaking. Yeah. Good to, to hear all, all presentations and, and it's very impressive to see all the work that has been going on. Um, we like the fabulous results that we can see from Norway. Um, and when I, when I hear about their presentation, it's one thing that especially strikes me, uh, which is the anchoring of this work that has been going on and that are now continuing in future and that are that is actually being scaled up to go from three municipalities now to go to 11 municipalities. And I would like to hear from uh, Norway if you could uh, give us an example of a key activity or key action that you felt was decisive in order to create this anchoring among uh, the decision makers for actually making this process possible. Thank you for the question, Nicholas. So you go on mute and Norway comes off mute to answer the question. Over to you, Helen or Birgit. Okay, uh, thank you, Nicholas. So the question is, was, what was the main factor that contributed to this kind of growth in projects? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Hello. Yes. Uh, I, I don't think we can say it's, it's one factor. Uh, but I think um, that having uh, the international network, uh, to be part of the international network, made us kind of brave to go out to say, hey, we want to help you and create new networks. So I think, to me, the key if I am to, to, uh, to mention one, I think to emphasize networking. We had an international network. We created or we contributed to new networks, uh, first among the three municipalities, then through workshops with other municipalities, then through all this list with others again, you know, and 
this kind of networking uh, I think is important and that involved also the director to health the Ministry of Health medical association in Oslo and the association for regional and uh, something yeah the municipalities <laughs> voila so you know to create a momentum of, of uh, we want something to happen and let's do it together uh, also on a national level but I but frankly, I, I don't think we could have done that without uh, having uh, research, the national network, you know, that kind of uh, safety with us entering into this. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Helen, for that explanation. And I could see on the picture that uh, Kirsty was making notes when you were speaking. So I'm looking forward to hear her later coming to the end. Is, th is there room for one more question from Sweden, Roger? Yes, go on, Peter. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm interested in the summer camps that you have in, in Canada. Uh, and uh, are they, are they popular and what, I, I couldn't exactly hear what ages you had for your summer camps and if they are popular and have you had them for so long that you have seen an impact, do, do the, the young people actually choose uh, medical or nurse educations later on? Uh, yes, thank you for the question, Peter, you can go on mute now and I'll, I'll uh, respond to that, that question. The short answer to your question is yes. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, health careers camps in Northern Ontario have been uh, held since uh, 2006, so we have many years of experience. Uh, essentially the way it works is that, that uh, high school students who are going into grades 10 and 11 in the following year, so in Northern Ontario we hold these in the summertime, so usually in July, it's a week-long camp. There's one held at Laurentian University and one held at Lakehead University and high school students going into grade 10 and 11 come from the communities and they spend a week at the university interacting with our students, our faculty members and, and, and the wider university community and they, they actually undertake a range of, of activities that make the connection between what they're studying at high school and health careers and thanks to television there is always a CSI theme. So they spend the week sort of solving the mystery. Uh, uh, the, the most uh, recent one here in Sudbury, there are actually two dead bodies uh, uh, that they started the, the week with. And so this is very popular. We, have, we are always heavily subscribed with interest uh, uh, from the high school students. We, we make a special effort to recruit Indigenous students, uh, students uh, uh, Francophone students, students from the remote rural communities. And they have, have, have this week together. And, and uh, the answer to your question is yes, that uh, these camps have been going for sufficient time that we now have medical students and students in other health disciplines who their first contact with health careers was actually attending the health careers camp. The story in Nunavut started in 2016 when the, uh, the, the government of Nunavut Department of Health sent two high school students uh, to the, the Thunder Bay uh, health careers camp. This was actually very well uh, received and very popular and we were able to then subsequently secure the funding from uh, the Canadian federal government to hold the health careers camp that was in February this year. And actually that's winter time, but the timing uh, in, the, in the Nunavut uh, situation actually uh, worked out very well. There's a lot of enthusiasm to, for this to become a regular event uh, into the future in Nunavut and we have secured federal government funding to hold another a similar camp uh, during 2019. Thank you, Roger. That was really great to hear. I, I love these uh, summer camps, and I, I think we should really try to make something similar here in Sweden. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Sweden, for your questions. I, I was thinking, uh, since we've already heard from Norway, maybe uh, uh, I'd like to, to hear if there are any questions or, or comments uh, from Norway. Uh, Helen or Birgit, if you have a question or someone in your in your group. I don't think there's any questions from the Norwegian conference. I think we pass on the word. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you, Helen. I, I, I think we should uh, just dwell for a moment on the, on the comments, the answer that Helen gave to the question. So the fact that this project that started with three communities is now spread to a much larger program in multiple parts of, of Norway uh, really is a result of the collaboration, the partnerships. And uh, she talked about, Helen talked about being brave, that's courage. Having the courage to take risks and, and, and to, uh, to see if it works and what works and doesn't work and absolutely uh, actively involving the communities, the municipalities, I think is a, is a, is a recurring theme really in the stories uh, that we've heard. I'd like to now uh, hear from Scotland. Do we have a question or comment from Scotland? Over to David Heaney. Hi, Roger. Yeah, we've got two points or two, two questions, in fact. Um, the first one is specifically to Sweden. Um, we'd be interested in knowing um, um, from the rural stream pilot what the interest is among students for, for coming and um, studying remote and rural practice. Well, David, um, for the first um, period, uh, we only had, I think, two or three students that were uh, actively willing to go rural. But for the second one, we had more than 15. So I think when uh, uh, the students have been very pleased with their education so far, and, and the rumor goes around at the medical school, so I, I think we will have a lot of students, uh, as many as we can take, probably. So it's been a really, really great, great success, I would say, so far. But we are just in the starting phase so far. Thank you uh, for that response. And you had a second question, David? Yeah, I think this is one that's more difficult. Um, and I'd like to open it up to the floor, maybe, and see if someone's prepared to answer this one. Um, Specifically in Scotland, because of the the uh, Scottish Rural Medicine Collaborative happening at the same time as our project, we focused on other staff, other than doctors. It actually worked out really well for us in Scotland because then we filled in a piece of the jigsaw that perhaps needed filled in. I also think that it meant that our work has produced products and services that are applicable to other other professional groups such as teachers. I'd like anyone else in the project to say how what they've done might be broadened out into um, other other health care groups or other professional groups. Well, thank you, David. Maybe we'll go around the countries and, and uh, ask uh, for their, their observations and comments on, based on their experience responding to the question that you've raised. Uh, uh, maybe we'll, we'll ask Iceland if Iceland has any comment or question or uh, response, I guess, to, uh, to the question you've raised. Iceland. Uh, yes, thank you, Roger. Uh, uh, are we supposed to comment on what uh, David was, or do we have a possibility to ask a question? Yes, just respond to David's challenge first, and then you can ask the question. Yeah, I believe that uh, these, uh, this framework and uh, this, tool, this toolbox, if you can call it that, is, uh, uh, can be used in, in other scenarios, and in both private and, and public uh, sector. So, so I, I think it's a generic uh, toolbox. So I, I'm, I'm definitely sure that this, this can be used in other places uh, where, where you need uh, the special uh, uh, trained people in rural areas. Uh, I would like to also propose one question while I'm at the microphone to the Swedes. Uh, last time we were in Storuman, you did mention a project that postgraduate education, that, with, that, that is speciality training in the university hospital, uh, had some kind of obligatory rural, rural component in it that wasn't there before. Is this, uh, is this just the beginning, or has this been going on for some time, and, and do you have any comments on it? Yes, we have. Uh, when you are uh, when you are resident uh, in in 
primary care, you, you can have a, a, a specialist education in rural medicine, which, which takes uh, approximately six to 12 months. It gives you a longer education, but you are compensated with salary. So you will have actually have specialist salary after approximately five years, but you will still be on the education in rural remote medicine for maybe six months to 12 months more. So, and this has been a, a great success. We, we went from three uh, residents to 12 residents within uh, uh, one and a half years. So. Thank you, Peter. Can you, do you have a response to the question from David Heaney as well about other health disciplines and, the, and sectors beyond health? Yeah, I mean, we have, um, we are here in Sweden, we're having uh, awesome municipalities taking part at our part of the conference. And you, you heard about the two cases that we highlighted from our work here in Sweden. And I think that when you hear uh, the type of uh, rural stream that we have spoken about to create for medical education students, that could be applied for teachers, it could be applied for other service professions that are requiring higher expertise uh, for, uh, secu to secure a long-term high quality provision. So yes, I mean, the work that we are doing within Sweden or that we have done in Sweden when it comes to, for instance, the rural stream, could easily be applied for other sectors. Okay. No, uh, and in, the, in addition, the work that has been done from the re relocation officers, uh, officer and the coordination work that Tina was speaking about, that is beneficial to all type of, of services, but also for private sector. Uh, expert uh, pro expert positions are often required in, in also in private sector and recruitment and, and positioning these expert positions are equally important because we li live here in a symbiotic uh, world and we are interdependent of each other. So uh, a work and an investment that, ha that has been initiated from Storum and municipalities is having a, a, a positive spillover effect to other sectors. Thank you for that response. So I'd like to just hear from Norway if, if there's a response from Norway uh, to the question, the challenge from David Heaney in Scotland. Yes, hello, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, concerning the framework, uh, we have uh, several comments here today from people who, who said that this is a, a generic framework which could be used uh, almost everywhere. Uh, and uh, um, we had comments uh, saying that you can use it uh, to recruit and retain any position in any municipality and we also even had a di director from the Ministry of Health uh, and <coughs> Care in Norway who was here commenting on the framework today and she said they could also use it internally in the Ministry of Health and Care to recruit for their positions. So, so the reactions in Norway is definitely that this is the generic framework. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that response. I'm going to give a, a brief response from Canada and then open up for further questions or, or comments. Uh, so from the Canadian perspective, uh, uh, several points to make. The first is, in the first Recruit and Retain project, uh, uh, the, the uh, strategic part of the project was actually looking beyond health to the broader public sector and we certainly found uh, uh, evidence from other sectors that, that the, the key elements, the, the uh, the interventions that are now in the framework, uh, uh, where they've been tried, uh, had a positive effect. So that's that's point number one. Point number two is when you look at the framework, you see uh, that uh, family support is is a key element of that, and and recruiting whether it's a doctor or a nurse or a member of another member of the health workforce, uh, another family member, maybe a teacher or maybe. Uh, uh, in the police force or, or maybe uh, in some other part of the, the public sector. So there's real value in looking at, at the broader uh, scope and, and not just saying, well, this is about health or, or, or and, and particularly not just about doctors. And my third comment is really our experience with Northern Ontario School of Medicine, although we, 
the, t the title of the school is medicine. We are, we are involved in the production of a, of a wide range of members of the health workforce, not only doctors, also registered dietitians, physician assistants, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, audiologists, pharmacists, uh, and radiation, uh, me sorry, medical uh, physicists. And, uh, and, and for many of those programs, uh, it, it, they have been going for sufficient time to show that implementing those elements that are in the framework for those, those health disciplines uh, are having the desired effect in terms of, of uh, retention and recruitment uh, uh, in those health disciplines and, and really enhancing the health team in the communities in Northern Ontario. So we've, we've responded to and we've heard questions from uh, the, the sites uh, across uh, the partner countries. I do want to have an opportunity, I said that, that those who have joined us by webcast have an opportunity to ask a question and make a comment, so let's hear uh, from those who are joining us by webcast. Uh, Kim. Uh, Stephen Cooper says he wants to let everyone know that he's attending, but he doesn't have any questions. <laughs> um, Robert Hamilton has a question for Norway. In your case study, municipalities, uh, what motivated the municipal leaders to get involved and stay involved in recruitment? Well, thank you. So that's a question for Norway. Did you hear the question? Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear and see us? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what motivated the municip municipal uh, leaders? Well, for the first, I think the, the main thing is that these municipalities had struggled with recruiting and re uh, retaining GPs so you know having a project offered to them kind of was uh, interesting and then uh, after about one year there was a national debate about recruiting and retention issues regarding GPs so uh, then they were of course uh, more motivated because this was an issue uh, everywhere maybe not in Oslo so much but in Big cities, small cities, small villages, everywhere. So, uh, and they had, you know, to to, to have um, have to pay for locums is very expensive. So, so I guess we did, we made a little push, and uh, but they were ready, kind of. They were ready. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, another question or comment from from uh, the webcasting. Yes, so Carrie Stewart and Sault Ste. Marie has a question for Iceland. In their recruitment efforts for specialty physicians, do they have specific challenges and solutions with recruitment due to lack of local clinical support? Question for Iceland. Did you hear the question? We look forward to your response. Uh, can you repeat the last part of the question? Yeah, the question was about recruiting uh, specialists in medicine and the challenge of having uh, limited local uh, clinical support for those specialties. Uh, no, I don't think we had uh, uh, diminished local support. I, I think that uh, we we have a sort of there, there's a culture of the physicians in the hospital supporting each other very well. Uh, it isn't a formal body system, if we, if we, if you could call it that. But uh, they, they, I think they feel very supportive, especially the new ones, because uh, there is a, there is a sort of a tradition that you can call on another, even if he is not on call. So if they're in town and 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 conscious, they usually help. Does that answer your question? No, good question. I'm just wondering what happens when they're unconscious. <laughs> but let's not go there. We're, we're, we're coming towards the end of this, this uh, time for questions and answers, so I'd like to give those who are in, in Thunder Bay an opportunity to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, so, uh, Penny Mooted Corbett, uh, is there anyone in Thunder Bay who'd like to, to contribute to this discussion? Penny? Um, Roger, we I have, have a couple of... For... Sorry? Go ahead, Penny. Uh, we do have a couple of people that would like to ask questions here, so I'll start with William and then back to them. Yeah. 
Can you turn on your microphone, please? Did you hear anything I said? <laughs> Not a word. Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm William Hettenhausen, and I'm an Associate Professor in Clinical Sciences Division and a Tutor Facilitator, Case-Based Learning, in Year 1 and 2. And I have also participated in <coughs> the student applicant um, interviews since 2004. And one thing that hasn't be, really been mentioned is priming the pump. Much of NASM's success is based on recruiting of medical students from the actual rural and remote communities that, where they need physicians. There's an old saying, it's easiest to bloom where you're planted. There's a strong tendency for many physicians to return to their home communities upon graduation. And so it's very important that, student, that, that this aspect of student recruitment be brought into uh, be brought into this discussion. The second thing is, is that uh, student, our, our student placement in rural, in rural and remote communities is not optional. Students in year one and year two are expected to, uh, to uh, spend six weeks in either a First Nations or another rural and remote community, and they're required to give a self-study project to their small group peers when they return. They're also encouraged to give presentations at local public schools to encourage students to, uh, to think about future careers as healthcare professionals. I'd also like to give five stars to the Youth Health Careers Camp, because I think it's a wonderful uh, way of recruiting students. Thank you, William. I, I heard there was one other question comment from Thunder Bay. We're now starting to run out of time, so make it brief, please. So there is one other question here, Roger. Good morning or afternoon or evening. My name is Paula Hoppen and I'm actually with a Francophone Immigration Support Network and I'm very excited and interested in what's been said this morning. I have some questions that I will email further to Sweden and to Iceland, Tak. Uh, in advance, but I do have one question for Iceland and it's about the interviews that were conducted for um, I guess the semi-structured interviews of the eight doctors. You said they were, most of them were foreigners. I'd be interested in finding out from which countries they were from. Um, and of course, the further question is, is it outside the European Union? Um, uh, I agree with uh, the gentleman who spoke earlier about recruiting locally, but there is still room for others. So I'm just interested in how, starting to find out about how you went about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, and I'll, I'll give Iceland a, an opportunity for a quick response, but I will highlight uh, two things first. Here is the opportunity to ask questions uh, beyond this forum, as has been mentioned by email, uh, and they will be responded to. And the other is there will be a full report from the Making It Work Recruit and Retain project, uh, and a lot more information than we were able to share just in, in the brief presentations today. So over to you, Siggy, a quick response from Iceland to that question. Yes, we're going to give the demographics in the report, but uh, I can say that these were eight physicians uh, with, with families, and uh, they are from both uh, the EU and outside the EU, from India, Latvia, and Poland, Poland, and uh, one family from Iceland. Thank you. I see that Sweden is keen to say something, a, a quick comment or question from Sweden. No, we have nothing to comment at this stage. Okay, thank you very much. I, just before we come to our closing remarks, uh, we have quite a large number of people here in, in Sudbury who've been sitting quietly. Now is an opportunity for a very quick question or comment, uh, if anyone has one. And uh, uh, I have two hands up, so they'll have to be very brief. Uh, but uh, yes, Paul, introduce yourself and ask your question or comment. Uh, yeah, I'm Paul Preston, I'm a GP from uh, the Northeast and Vice President Clinical of the local Lynn. Uh, I was struck by the brilliance of the postcard campaign in Sweden because I imagine the millennials would be startled at the novelty of that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they would I would assume either not recognize it or think it was from their grandparents if their grandparents were elderly. Uh, and so I wonder if there's, uh, you could elaborate more on the uh, success rate and if it was followed up. Thank you. And then uh, Richard, do you want to say something? <clears throat> 
Uh, just some comments. Uh, I'm a GP from a community of less than 10,000 for the last 40 years. Uh, just like to comment on uh, technology, uh, which is sort of what, what you're following up on. Um, what I found is that, uh, again, it, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, sometimes uh, people uh, rely on the technology uh, as opposed to talking with their uh, colleagues. And so uh, they, they work on uh, guidelines um, without understanding the pathophysiology. And uh, uh, back when I started, I used to go to the doctor's lounge and talk with my colleagues there. Now people uh, get their answers uh, through this. So that uh, can break down the technology. On the other hand, I've used uh, uh, telemedicine. I've taken my patients to see the specialist, and I found that actually it works as a CME thing in that our uh, continuing professional development, because it's now changed, um, it is that I can then ask my colleagues specific questions uh, that I want to know, and so it works as a, uh, an education for me. In terms of the education, uh, it's nice to have that technology, but it's also nice to get out of your community when you don't, uh, aren't on call 24-7. Um, the other thing is uh, your wheel here I think is great, Roger, um, but uh, again, uh, th there are sort of specifics. Um, you know, a, a married couple is, again, it's a pros and cons. Uh, when they want to get out, the two of them go out, and that can then uh, lead a, a vacuum in the community. I think in a community, you also have critical numbers. Um, so that when you're really down low uh, in numbers, it's hard to attract because nobody else wants to come in because they know they're going to be worked off their feet. When you then get up to a critical number, then it's much easier to recruit. When you're looking at retention, one of the things you did comment on is burnout. And I think, again, that is uh, an issue that uh, needs to be addressed. I'm with the uh, Canadian Society of Physician, uh, Senior Physicians uh, in Canada, and again, I think that's an issue that uh, needs to be looked at, is burnout in the later years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Many of the themes that you've mentioned will, will come back for those of us who are continuing uh, in the second part of the forum here in Canada. Uh, and they're really contextual issues, including changes, changing use of, of, of technology and opportunities that present. I'll just give Sweden uh, the opportunity for a quick two-sentence response to the question about the, uh, the postcards. Over to you, Sweden. Thank you, Roger. Um, um, uh, Tina has left uh, our conference. She had to go and pick up the kids. So um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that should answer that one. I only have the statistics of the number of postcards sent, sent out, and that was 1,500 uh, identified people that had recently moved in, in uh, moved out from um, Storum. I think it's during the last 10, 10 years. Um, and, and the success rate of actually having uh, being successful to send them to them was that 250 of the postcards was returned. So 1,250 of the postcards were sent out. But we don't have any statistics since the, uh, we should say that the, the activities expected are more passive activities to uh, sign up for newsletters, etc., and get information through various channels. But we don't have the statistics in front of us. Thank you. So that really fits into the, uh, the uh uh, conditions for success that's about monitoring and evaluation. We're now coming towards the end of the, of the international part of, of the forum and, uh, and I want to move on to closing remarks. We have a special guest with us uh, from Copenhagen, uh, Kirsty Meinheimer. Uh, she's the head of the Northern Periphery and Arctic uh, Secretariat. So as we say on television in Australia, now from a word, for a word from our sponsor. So now, uh, Kirsty, it's your turn to go off mute and to uh, to make some closing remarks uh, on behalf of the Northern Periphery and Arctic program. Kirsty. Thank you very much for this opportunity to join your conference today. Um, uh, yes, hello from Copenhagen. 
Um, and it was so interesting to uh, listen to all the different examples from the different parts of uh, your project. And I, I think I learned a lot of new, I think I thought I knew the project, but I learned a, a lot of new things. Um, what I can say is that um, when the first project was approved in the previous program period in June 2011, it was already very clear to the program that this topic of recruiting and retaining healthcare professionals in, in remote and rural communities was highly relevant to our program area. And in fact, uh, the program gave some additional money to the project to take it more to a strategic level. And um, I think the intervention we presented today demonstrated that um, the, the recruit and retain concept can take many different forms depending on the context, the local needs, the availability of facilities and the well-established links with institutions, um, administrative and political support. So one of the lessons that, that I draw from your presentation today is that in order to be successful, you really need to adapt the concept to carefully to the conditions on the ground and keeping um, people at the center of everything you do. Um, what we are looking for as a program are proven concepts suitable for remote and sparsely populated communities. And it seems that this is certainly the case for recruit and retain. And uh, ideally, this should be really implemented. And we saw some um, examples of that. We saw examples of outside interests. So from organizations outside the partnership, we saw examples of outside funding um, um, coming to the, the, the different partners, uh, actual implementation, actual statistics of the concept working. So the, the number of people that were retained and recruited that way. And also a lesson was that a network offers safety and that it's important to involve young people already uh, from the start. So, so all in all, I think this is showing a very um, well-rounded, very successful concept and a concept that could be applied to other fields as well. Um, I, I'm actually, I have a question myself. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask one. Um, I, I'm interested in uh, what would you as, your, as a project see um, has been your impact on policy uh, development. Do you see that and what shape does that take? Uh, because that's also interesting for us as a program. But, uh, but other than that, I, I wish you luck in this uh, final phase of your project, wrapping everything up and, and capturing all the results. and. Um, and in such a way that they can inspire other people, in fact. So um, I would say congratulations on a good project and on a good event. And um, I look forward to receiving your final report. So that's what I would like to say. Hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsty. And, and yes, you may ask that question, but we really are out of time. We're now one minute over the advertised uh, finishing time for, for this uh, uh, for this international part of the forum. So I'm just going to quickly respond to your question and then make a, a few closing remarks uh, myself. Uh, I, I would say a central theme of what you said, Kirsty, uh, is, is summed up by the phrase, context is critical. It's critically important to understand uh, the local context in rural and remote uh, communities and then, uh, and then develop models that are, that are very much uh, uh, working in that, in that, that context. In relation to your question about policy, um, I think you've, it wasn't highlighted in this way in the presentations, but the example in, in Norway is a good one where uh, what started as, as, a, as this project with three communities is, has, has now uh, actually attracted the attention of the politicians and the policy makers and led to a program, a much more extensive program in three different regions in Norway. So here's a very practical example of, of, of the work of this project actually then uh, not only having policy implications but leading to, uh, to new program initiatives uh, in other parts of the country, so at the national level. And if we had time, each of the, the partners could speak about uh, similar examples or examples in their own country of, of the way in which uh, uh, this this work has actually contributed to policy development and led to, to new, much wider, broad-based uh, uh, initiatives uh, in their own country. So thank you for that question. Thank you to the Northern Periphery and Arctic Program for, for the support of this project. And it's now for me to say thank you 
uh, to all of you for your participation. I think I, we have heard in the presentations really remarkable, quite substantial achievements that have occurred at the local level with regional ramifications and, and, and even national implications, as I have mentioned. But as you've heard more than once, uh, the success of the project really has come through the transnational collaboration, uh, through uh, those of us who are in remote rural communities in, in the northern part of, of the European countries and Canada are actually working together uh, and, 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 and establishing interventions with that courage, with that commitment uh, and with the partnerships uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be as successful as we have in the way uh, that you've heard. You've heard that there will be a final report of this project. There's a, there's a more extensive version of, of the, of the uh, this is a summary document uh, that ex explores more of the framework. There will be the opportunity for follow-up questions by email or, or other electronic means. So this is, this is the end of this international part of the forum, but it's by, by no means the end of this process. This is, this is really this considerable momentum and, and a real commitment amongst the partnerships, although this funding has stopped for us, for us to continue to work in as a transnational partnership. Before I close, I want to thank everybody for your participation uh, uh, in, in all parts of, of uh, uh, the northern part of Europe and, and across uh, northern Canada as well, and some other, we've had some other participants from sneaky other countries uh, as well. Um, so thank you all for your participation. And before I close, like an event like this doesn't just happen. There's been a lot of planning and preparation, a lot of work to... Uh, and, you, and you've met the, some of the teams in, in each of the participating countries. But I do want to just particularly recognise the team here with the Northern Ontario <coughs> School of Medicine, uh, uh, Tammy Gran, uh, uh, the, on the technology side, uh, Aaron Wright uh, and Kim Larkin on communications. Without uh, the, the, uh, their teamwork and their hard work, we wouldn't have been able to come together today. So let's have a round of applause for all of those. I snuck an extra five minutes, uh, having said we were going to stick to time. And what I've been doing is eating into your eating time. For those of you in Europe, it's time for the evening meal. And here in Canada, we're going to have lunch, and then we will continue our forum after the lunch. Uh, for us, uh, 1, 1 p.m. Uh, is when we'll reconvene for the second part of the forum. Thank you all again for your participation. I'll say thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>